This is a photo that you recognize. It's a photo of an event horizon taken uh, last year, 2019, uh, of a black hole, of a singularity. And for us, this metaphor refers to, at Singularity University, refers to the fact that we can't look beyond the present with great certainty. You can't look beyond a certain point. No one can predict the future. And in 2005, Ray Kurzweil wrote a book titled Singularity is Near. And the thought behind the title is that this point that we can't look beyond is getting closer to us. Uh, the main law in his book uh, is uh, the law of accelerating returns that shows the accelerating exponential pace of the cultural evolution and of our technological evolution. And that allows for Ray Kurzweil to predict uh, that we will experience not a hundred years of progress in the next hundred years, but that, will be, that it will feel like 20,000 years of change. Science fiction eating the world. And then the question becomes, what kind of future do we envision? What kind of world do we want to live in? Darwin wrote about the uh, evolution theory, that species uh, that adapt to changing environments uh, will survive, and that who don't uh, might not survive. And the question is whether we as humans will be uh, capable of adapting to that exponential world, that exponential pace of our cultural evolution. I mean, we are making uh, uh, that right. Um, but if I would go into the streets and I would ask uh, the difference between linear and exponential thinking, people are not wired that way. So let's say I go on a walk and I take 30 steps. Uh, it takes me 30 meters, that's clear. But if I take 30 exponential steps, people probably wouldn't recognize uh, 30 doublings. They wouldn't recognize that it's 25 times across the globe, a billion meters. Because our brains evolved over a very long period, hundreds of thousands of years, in an environment that was local and linear. So we are wired to think local and linear, and we overestimate the short term and we underestimate the long term effects. When we face uncertainty, we are non-granular. We, we have three modes, basically. It's either uh, there is a lion, it will happen, I need to run. Uh, there is not a lion, uh, I don't need to run, I can relax. Um, or there might be a lion, I need to stay alert. And there has been a lot of research in that um, yeah, psychology in our brain, uh, for instance, also by uh, Kahneman, who got the Nobel Prize and here the, the Medal of uh, Freedom. And uh, he basically says that uh, our minds crave certainty. And when they don't find it, they, they impose it. And I think that's, a, that's a, yeah, very illustrative also for the political climate that we currently face. Um, something else that he uh, states is uh, that the mother of all cognitive illusions is what you see is all there is. If we can't look beyond a certain point, and that point is getting closer to us, as Ray Kurzweil says, that might be a human bias that have, has um, bad consequences. And that's why I like the, the quote by uh, the American rocket scientist Goddard that lived a century ago that said, and I need to move the participants list, so otherwise I can't see it, uh, we are too ignorant to safely pronounce anything impossible. We can hardly say with certainty that anything is necessarily within or beyond the grasp of an individual. It has often proved true that the dream of yesterday is the hope of today and the reality of tomorrow. And we live in an exponential world. If you look at our population growth, the energy use per person, uh, the pace of technological change, it's especially clear since the knee of the curve, the industrial revolution. And if you would compare the lives of people prior to the Industrial Revolution, the lives would be very similar. Even of a great-grandfather, uh, the life would be quite similar to the, the life of his great-grandchild. While the life of your children will be dramatically different from, from your life, and especially from the life of your parents. And so if I would take somebody from, let's say, 12,000 years ago, when we moved from a nomadic existence 
to an agricultural existence and I would warp them to the present, there would be an overwhelming, incomprehensible, magical experience probably. And uh, so if Ray, Ray Kurzweil was talking about 20,000 years of change, what does it mean? How much change will we actually experience and where? Um, even the last few decades, we've seen so much progress and change. I mean, this is a picture in the middle of Dubai and on the right is also Dubai. But even in decades, it has transformed. You see that also not only in the Middle East, but also in, in Asia. So if the world is accelerating, it's more than ever important to keep a beginner's mind, to be open to change and to resist the, the tendency of the mind to crave certainty and to only look at what, what you can see. So this is a, a, a linear curve and this is an exponential curve. And over time, of course, the difference between uh, the, the pace of change is, is uh, huge. And so we should uh, test ourselves. We should challenge our assumptions. We should challenge our belief system and experiment and uh, uh, start conversations and deep dialogue with others to test each other's um, assumptions and belief systems. Sometimes it also helps to, to, to create challenges and moonshots because it allows yourself to leave all the legacy behind and to focus on something that feels very unrealistic. Uh, but also your tendency to avoid failure uh, reduces because it's, it's so unrealistic, it's so huge, it's so, it's so uh, large that you probably feel less worried if you wouldn't make it. And uh, psychology turns out that you could rather focus on such things that are 10 times hard than uh, an incremental progression of 10% and a 10% improvement. So try to, to, to create goals that are really large. Uh, this is uh, part of the thinking of Peter Diamandis, the other co-founder of Singularity U. And he's famous for several companies, but also for his uh, 60s. So I'll, I'll briefly explain those. Uh, a linear curve, an exponential curve, and when something digitizes or when something industrializes, industrializes, it follows an exponential curve. And when it digitizes, uh, over time you see the, the large uh, divide, but it also dematerializes. So you used to have a physical camera as an object in your house. And now mostly, most of us use most of the time our phones to take a picture. So in that sense, that functionality has dematerialized, but not only the camera itself, also the pictures. You used to have a film roll, you used to have to, to develop the pictures, and all that has been dematerialized as a result of digitization. Uh, but therefore, it has also demonetized. You don't need to pay anymore for a film roll or to have them developed. You can easily share the pictures with everyone for free. You can easily take a picture for free. And because that functionality is now so cheap, it is democratized. Most of us have the capability to take a photo without significant cost. That's all clear to us now. But a while back, that was very deceptive. In the beginning, it's hard to see whether something is on a linear curve, let's say chemical photography, or on an exponential curve, like digital photography. I mean, the digital camera was invented by Kodak themselves. They knew the law of the doublings of uh, the pixels uh, per year. So they were uh, very uh, much aware of the digital exponential curve, but still it came uh, to be very disruptive for the company and filed for bankruptcy when Instagram uh, was, was went for an IPO or, or was bought. So, so why does this happen? If, even if you're aware of that change, even if you are aware of that pace, why, why don't you change? Uh, and that has to do with that beginner's mind, but also with something that uh, yeah, relates to, let's say, gravity uh, for this crowd. Uh, but uh, Keynes, for instance, said the difficulty is not so much in developing new ideas, it's, it's more in escaping from the old ones. And we're pulled to, to a world that we knew, we are pulled to, to certainty that we assume. Uh, but but it's, it's hard for us to, to change our mind when the facts change. Um, we all know the scientific method. We all know that, that that's the way we should live. But it's hard to change our mind sometimes when the facts change. And we also know that uh, the lean movement now is echoing what the scientific method and 
Keynes, for instance, has said that we need to try to fail, to analyze, adjust, and try again. But in our daily lives and in organizations, it can be hard to do so. It's important to realize that these, uh, uh, this exponential curve is not one smooth curve. It's actually uh, a multitude of accelerating S-curves that build on top of each other. And think of waves. So there is a scientific breakthrough, a wave, and it allows for an organization or a person to surf upon that wave with the new technological applications. Uh, and for a while it goes well, but the wave will die out and it will be a new scientific breakthrough that allows for more effective and efficient technical applications that will become more dominant over time. So it's important to, to have that playfulness, to understand that timing, when you st should start paddling, learning on that, of that new scientific breakthrough, to be open for a new wave coming. And I think somebody who was a, a very good example of that is this letter by Einstein to Roosevelt, where you see on the left bottom, where he states that there is a scientific breakthrough in France and the Americas that allows for nuclear energy or a nuclear bomb. And in 1939, that is a critical moment for to make your strategy uh, if, it's, if it comes to uh, starting and winning a war. Uh, so he, he wrote this letter and basically that letter started um, Oppenheimer and his team to work in Los Alamos to create a nuclear bomb. Of course, we all agree that uh, we rather would, would not want to have uh, nuclear bombs in our lives. Also not the Nazi regime, but also not the nuclear bomb. So later on, we try to uh, rein in that technology and that application. It shows that it's, uh, technology is just a means to an end. We should always think of the end. So the end could be uh, experiencing music. and. For a while, LPs were the dominant source technological application to have us experience music. Of course, uh, prior to that, it was a live experience of music, but for uh, recorded music, it was LPs that we used. Mm. Then cassettes became more dominant. CDs, flash memory became more dominant. Streaming is now most dominant. And we all assume that it's that that or we feel or we yeah intuitively uh, experience that this is the way it will always be but of course there will be a new way of experiencing music it might be that your brain will directly be stimulated to experience music even surpassing your ears same goes for the fridge you're so used to the fridge in your house but there were less effective ways to store food and there will be more effective ways to store food even a biotechnological solution or um, instant delivery, for instance. The same goes for computing power. There are many methods to create computing power, many S-curves to create computing power. And the beauty is that Ray Kurzweil showed that's going on for a long while now, even through wars, two world wars, through several crises, this exponential curve continues on a log logarithmic chart. You see now a beautiful exponential uh, chart. And it doesn't end with the integrated circuit. There will be new ways and new means to create computing power. It could be a quantum computer or it might be a photonics. So in 97, it required millions of dollars and a lot of space to create a certain amount of computing power. And nine years later, uh, for $500, you had more computing power in the, in the, in the bedroom of my uh, brother. That is disruption. That, that is an exponential curve. And then people say, okay, it probably ends here, but it continues. Now computing power, computing power is now so, so cheap and so small that you can attach it to physical objects, creating the Internet of Things, creating machine-to-machine -machine communication, where you had a period where you had a mechanical device and you added electricity, and that was a revolution. Now we add smartness or computing power to objects creating smart thermostats, for instance. But the beauty is, it's not about the speed, it's not about the power or the tininess of the chips. It's about the creativity of ordinary people. It's about now imagination is the seeding. A friend of mine, for instance, uses this to, uh, to save rhinos. And I always think by myself, okay, is there time? Am I not too late? Is it, am I, is it possible to surf on a wave or 
which wave? Uh, so we all know the HoloLens, this is in the present, but you would probably be surprised that in 52 already uh, people went uh, to the first 3D movie and that in 1861 Holmes was working on the first visual 3D experience. So there is still time. Uh, the beauty of an exponential curve and is that the deceptive phase can take quite a long time. Uh, for instance, with additive manufacturing, I think additive manufacturing is now becoming uh, more dominant, but it took 30, 35 years. I think uh, it started in the 1980s or so. So the deceptive phase is long, but there are always also new waves, uh, new waves of change, new ways of new scientific breakthroughs and new applications that can be built upon those breakthroughs. And uh, I especially, uh, to stick with Goddard, he in 1899 already thought of traveling to Mars when climbing the tree. And in 1926, he built the first liquid fuel rocket. And a hundred years later, now we have a starship uh, that possibly can even take us in the next few decades to, to, to Mars. And talking about the next few decades of your life, uh, there's something called the escape velocity curve. Uh, Ray Kurzweil and Aubrey de Grey they use that phrase uh, to, to, to refer to the fact that technology might be able to add yearly a healthy year to your life which makes for your life to become perhaps 120 years old. So what does it mean for, for your career? What does it mean for your organization? What does it mean for your, for your retirement, uh, for the time you spend with your children, uh, for social evolution? These kind of thoughts uh, should be discussed together, I think, uh, and, and to be part of policy. And when you have those crazy ideas like Goddard has, you will be criticized. Uh, people will think you're a lunatic. Uh, and the, the New York Times was very critical in the, a century ago in 1920 to Goddard's dream to, uh, to actually travel to Mars or to, uh, to, to, to have a rocket fly. Uh, and he said, every vision is a joke until the first man accomplishes it. Once realized, it becomes commonplace. And for you, of course, it is commonplace. But for most of us, it's not commonplace to think of settlements on the moon or settlements on Mars. And somebody who gets that, so let's forget his tweets, but somebody who gets that uh, is, is Elon Musk. He sees that there's a convergence of technologies that accelerate each other and he sees those price performance curves that dramatically drop. And a price performance curve, you might know it, but just to, to shortly explain it, uh, allows you to buy for the same amount of money more capacity or for less money the same capacity. So you would acquire, for instance, solar panels and you would get uh, more uh, solar panels for the same amount of money and therefore more energy. And he realized if I would industrialize the production of uh, batteries, then they would probably also follow such a price performance curve that exp exponentially declines over time. And that will be uh, make possible to, to, to build a car uh, that is an electric car, a vehicle, that is very competitive to the cars that are currently produced. And this was a while back, of course. Uh, but uh, when he introduced uh, the, the Tesla Model 3, he, the, the battery itself was $35,000. Uh, and the car was promoted also to be sold for $35,000. And he was capable to do so because he was delivering the car later. And he therefore outperformed all the other car manufacturers. Car manufacturers. Uh, so, so this is important. And he also realized that there's an accelerating pace of technology, uh, for instance, on computing power and artificial intelligence. So it would be possible to create a digital drive experience, to create a computer on wheels, uh, perhaps in the future even self-driving cars. So the first order implication is for the car manufacturers, the other car manufacturers. But the second order implication is where do we park? I mean, the cars would probably park themselves. So we wouldn't need all those parking places in a city like Amsterdam anymore. That's a second order implication if self-driving self vehicles would appear. And the third order would be, uh, so what happens to the parking income of a city like Amsterdam? Uh, 
how will they allocate that new space? Will, will it be more green in the city? What will happen to the real estate value? Will people move outside of the city to the countryside? Now mobility is so cheap and fast and efficient. Or with the new green, would they want to stay in the city? So it's important to have that layered approach to, to change and to think it through in several orders. Uh, but the most important thing is, of course, to see that technology is just a means to an end. It should be aimed right. It should be solving the many problems we still have on Earth. Uh, there's so much we can improve, so many lives we can positively impact to work on, on the SDGs or the Global Grand Challenges, however you want to call them. And space, the work, uh, what you are working on, is, is the, perhaps the most beautiful one, because while working on uh, traveling, to the moon or to Mars and creating settlements there, you will probably have to solve many of the SDGs that we currently also face on Earth. Uh, you would definitely have to work on shelter and water and health, uh, governance models, food. Uh, you would uh, need to be uh, self-sustaining. Um, Energy-wise, you need to be disaster resilient. So the beauty of space is that it will cover many of these things. And by working on, on a challenge like space, uh, you will face so many challenges that it will be very beneficial for humankind on Earth to, to, to use those applications. So I know that you've now uh, released a new innovation plan. I haven't seen it, of course, but I'm curious, what's next? What is your loon shot? What's, the, what's your crazy idea? And to finish, uh, I want to emphasize that it's important that technology should increase, elevate human dignity. It should increase human potential and not the other way around. So I'll end with the video. Good morning, Your Holiness. My name is Tilly and I'm so honored to be here today. Thank you so much for inviting me. I had a severe disease when I was 15 months old called meningitis septicemia. They basically said that I was 100% going to die, but somehow I pulled through and I'm here today. I like these hands because they look futuristic and cool and you can even have lights in it, so you know. I was so young when I lost them, I don't remember having them. And just, I know that there's real people out there who've had hands their whole life, and then all of a sudden they're just gone. And I just thought it was really important for them to have the support that they needed. I wanna embrace the fact that we're unique. We don't, we don't mind being different. The modern technology, very, very helpful. But look, Africa. Yeah. Many poor people. Oh. And then, less developed country. Oh, suffering. Oh, immense.